Welcome to episode 3 of A Spy in Exile, Define Double Death. This is a series of interviews with the former MI5 and Special Branch agent Martin McGartland, who infiltrated the provisional IRA during the late 80s and early 90s. If you missed episodes 1 and 2 of A Spy in Exile, you can catch up on them now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean and other audio apps. These interviews are also available on YouTube. Due to the serious level of threat still on Martin McGartland's life, this interview has been recorded over a secure connection and his voice has been altered. A major said to me, Marty, professional IRA, you're under arrest. And I thought, fucking hell. Now, I'm not joking you about, seriously. I thought they were going to shoot me there and fucking then. Because what happened was they started to take my shoe, they took my shoes off, and this was, this is like calamity fucking stuff. This they took my shoes off, and they started taking my laces out, and they were using the laces to tie my feet. And I thought, what the fuck is laces going to be to tie my feet and my hands? And when they put me on the floor, they put like a gun to the back of my fucking head, and I thought they're going to shoot me here and then. So what happened was they got me under a settee, and they put me under a settee, under the settee. And do you know one of them car blankets? You get like a chucky car blanket. It's very thin. They put one of them over my head, face down, fucking roasting hot summer's day in the middle of fucking August. The radio was going in the background. Do you remember that song, Brian Adams, Everything I Do, I Do For You? That was playing in the fucking background constantly. It was number one on the charts for about fucking, I think it was about 20 weeks or something. And that was fucking playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. I thought to myself, I have made the biggest mistake of my life. But... To summarize, it was clear that these people weren't interested in interrogating me. It was clear that they were only acting as like go-betweens. But they were all part of the, obviously, internal security team because they wouldn't allow them to be involved in that sort of a scale of an operation. But what they done was, because I was so hot onto this blanket, I kept on like trying to move my head. You know, I'm tied up at this time. My hands is tied down the front and my legs is tied together around my fucking ankles. But only wear my own laces. And also, they asked me when I actually got there, and that was another thing that made me really, really fucking suspicious. They said to me, Marty, did you bring a car with you? And I said, no. I think I said to them, I got a bus or a taxi. And they went, oh, that's all right. And I thought, here we'll fucking go. It's exactly what the special front said to me. So whenever we drove there and I'm inside the flat tied up, they searched my pockets. And I think I had about 500 quid in my pocket. Don't know why I had it, but I had the money in my pocket. The found a set of keys. And they all started to panic, like, fuck, here's some car keys. Well, why do you tell me you didn't have a car and stuff? No. <laughs> and I made some excuse up, fucking saying, all right, whatever. No, they came by bus or taxi, whatever. And they were panicking, like, fuck, about, the state, the, about me having these car keys. When I was there, I, I kept moving the fucking blanket with my head, no nudging my head, because it was really fucking sweating underneath that blanket. And I actually asked the young bloke, the youngest word of them all, the youngest one who was actually already in the flat. I asked him, can I have some water? And he gave me some water and stuff and all like that. He was reading the book and I think uh, the other guy was reading the book and uh, the one of the other two people who took me from the fucking Sinn Féin Center who have named fucking since like 20 years right up to the present day or 30 years. Them two, obviously, one of them had went out and I presumed he had went, obviously, to tell the boys, the top players in the internal security unit that we've got him, he's all tied up, he's up there, blah, blah, blah. But he went away. But when I was there on the fucking uh, ski land down, I remember hearing helicopters. Helicopters, I'd say, not just one, but two, because you could hear like two, one was a bit further away. And I thought, oh, fuck me, they're probably like, looking for me, blah, 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 blah. And I remember when I looked through the neck curtains, I could actually see a fucking helicopter, like, at that in the distance. And I thought to myself, that gave me like a real, real boost, thinking of they're, they're probably going to come and rescue me. And one other thing that I heard, and this was really the thing that really made me believe, yeah, fuck me, Felix is going to come and get me. I heard dogs barking, and I heard a British accent saying, shut up! Well, when I heard that, the guys inside the house started to panic like fuck. I also heard Land Rovers, which are known as DMSUs, Divisional Mobile Support Unit. They're very distinctive. They're like big V8 motors. When one gets by, you know what it is. I could hear them going up and down the fucking street on a few occasions, and I was convinced they were going to come and fucking rescue me. But they never did. I think it was shortly before six o'clock. Now, burn in mind, I was in that flat from half fucking ten in the morning. I decided, oh, you know, kind of go to the toilet. And they said to me, yeah, they untied, I think they, un- they untied my hand, yeah. My feet were still tied. I hopped into 
the fucking bathroom. And what happened was the three people at that time were really agitated about something because remember, they had a weapon in the fucking, at least one weapon in that flat. So, and I'm tied up hand and fucking foot, feet, feet, hand and feet. If the fucking police, army, or anybody had had that flat, they were all going to get done for false imprisonment and fucking kidnapping. The ring up was the very least. So, when I went to the actual fucking toilet, as soon as I went into the toilet, I looked at the bath, and the minute that I looked at the bath, I virtually had a fucking flashback from years gone by where my mum, many years before, had caught me glue sniffing, and she was so angry. So upset, she dragged me down the street in front of all my friends, virtually by the fucking hair, dragged me up the stairs, put me in a bath of water, and nearly fucking drowned at me. To actually, I came round to like normal, because I was like as high as a kite. And after she'd done that, right, I fucking was nearly, honestly, she nearly fucking killed me. And the minute that I seen that bath, I turned on my heels, hopped back into the sitting room. The three people were nowhere to be seen. But they were in the kitchen, and I stood against the wall, and I remember saying to myself, Kathy, or Kathy Catherine, if you're looking down on me, please protect me, or words to that effect. And I just hopped, 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 jumped to the very top of the window, because I thought if I jumped to the top, the glass won't come down and fucking obviously, like, pierce my skin. And that was it. Bang. I can't remember anything else until I woke up. And I remember a woman's face, who I didn't know her at the time, but I found out later on that she was a relation of one of my friends. What happened was there was a woman cradling me going there, son, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay, there's an almond's coming. And it turns out that the woman who was cradling me had actually run into the street, because when I was unconscious, because I landed on my head, she, seen the same three people, had run down the stairs and grabbed me lifeless body and tried to drag me back up. And the people thought that they were beating me up and they thought it was like some sort of like a fucking gang beating soldier. And they ran out and they ran away. And they phoned the ambulance and took me to the fucking, uh, they took me to the hospital and I got the nurse when I came round to phone my number that I had in, um, with special branch. And I said to them, tell them that Carl obviously is in the hospital, tell them where I am and they came and got me. That woman saved your life? She did. And do you know what? Do you know the funny thing about it is, and this is the truth, I found out later on that she was actually the sister of one of my very good friends who had lived in Twinbrook. There must have been someone looking over you that day. So you woke up in hospital. What happened next? Did Special Branch wrap you in cotton wool? They didn't. Do you know what they told me? This is the God's truth. I'll never forget this. I told them who kidnapped me. And do you know what they told me? I didn't know who the third man. I do now. I know who he is now. I named him in the paper recently when I found out who he is. He himself has been killed as for being an informer. But what happened was, right, the special branch told me, CID's coming to speak to you. Don't mention the names of the people who kidnapped you. When I questioned it, I was been left under the impression that special branch were doing something. Obviously, I thought special branch were going to arrange for them to be arrested or something. That was my belief. Because you need to remember, that was back in 1991. And at that time... I didn't know fuck walls about steak knives and no one knew about fucking steak knives and no one knew how dirty the dirty war was back then. Can there be any explanation as to why Special Branch did not want you to name the people who kidnapped you? Well, it's obvious. The reason why they didn't want me to name names for was because of what I got arrested. Did the penny drop in hospital that you actually weren't being protected as much as what you thought? No, because you know what? Silly me. The people who kidnapped me were Jerry Adams' bodyguards and Jerry Adams' driver. High-profile people. They were also members of the internal security team. And as time went by, alarm bells were starting to fucking sound. I think, hang on a minute. How can two... The both of them are convicted IRA terrorists. They've been, had convictions. One was caught with explosives and fucking or weapons or something. And the other one was fucking done with a attempt at murder of a fucking an army major or something like that, or somebody in the army. So they both, in fact, they both of them had convictions <clears throat> for IRA, sort of like terrorist offences. As time was going by, I thought to myself, hang on a fucking minute. Why would the police not want to arrest two people who are so close to Jerry Adams and who were actually watched by Ian Phoenix's TCG? TCG is made up of army surveillance E4A, uh, surveillance, E4 in general, which is all you see, special branch surveillance, yeah? 
and also like other people who've connected with like MI5 and stuff and that, it comprises of MI5, the Army and Special Branch. That's what he, that's, that's what fucking TC is. And what happens is all these people's watching these fucking people kidnapping me in broad daylight and no one decides that they should be fucking arrested. And I thought as ten goes by, something's not right here. And that's when I started to realise, hang on a fucking minute. So you're still in hospital. At any point, did you realise that perhaps the will was being pulled over your eyes? I I am been a hundred percent truthful here to you. Yeah? Even by the time I made the program with John Moore, the one that's called the Informer, but that program when I made that program a year later, I was still convinced at that time that the special branch just lost me. And then when it dawned on me, I thought, hang on a fucking minute. The special branch just don't lose people because of the fucking one of the most fucking well trained groups, want, you know, police forces in the fucking probably Europe or in the world at that time, because they were heavily involved in actually fighting fucking terrorists and, and fucking serious organized crime, like obviously like MI5 and fucking like special branch and fucking the army and everybody. And what I'm saying to you is, right, they don't lose people. And then the more I looked at it, I thought to myself, well, hang on. They couldn't have lost me, because you know what happens? I only found out later on. They told me that TCG have sort of mobile surveillance vehicles, right? And this is what they do. It's very fucking, it's it's very sort of like um, straightforward, but it's very effective. What they do is, they had 24 hours notice. They know I'm going to the Sinn Féin Centre the following morning. They know I'm going to be getting kidnapped. Ian Phoenix submitted that in his book. And what you need to remember is, when somebody walks into the Shane Fein Center, unless they're fucking like Houdini, as day follows night, night follows day, they have to come back out the same fucking door, either the front door or the back, back door. They have to come back out the way they went in. So in other words, they can't just fucking basically disappear. There's a surveillance team watching that fucking door and watching the, the, the immediate vicinity. And they're same people going in and the same people coming out with me, right? Now, when I said about that car skidding and them IRA people driving away, I panicked. But what I didn't realize then and what I know now because of the mass amount of information that has been disclosed over the years in books by the Ombudsman's Office in Northern Ireland and all the other things, is right? What they done was they set up a surveillance sort of operation, which is so, so sophisticated that it's impossible for anybody to basically escape. And what they do is, right, if they had decided to take me down Anderson's town to go down towards the falls, that would have been covered. If they had decided they were going to take me on foot into Anderson's town estate, that would have been covered. If they had decided they were going to take me up towards Stewartstown Road or Twinbrook, which they did do, that would have been covered. And one thing you need to remember also too is, on top of that, these mobile units and people on foot and stuff now, when you go down to the left, down towards the Falls Road, you have the Anderson's Town Barracks, which is basically at the junction of Glen Road and Anderson's Town. So that car has to pass there, yeah? And if it goes the other way, you've got Woodburn Barracks. So the fucking, the whole thing was all tied up. And then they used aerial surveillance, helicopter and stuff and all like that. So, I was just dumb as fuck. I believed that, you know, I genuinely believe, because I believed in Special Branch, I believed in Phoenix. I thought, oh, yeah, fuck me. You know, my two kidnapper, uh, kidnappers, you know, who are two dippy fuckers. I mean, daft fuck, the most stupidest people on the planet. You know, me dumb and dumber. I mean, the way they've done it, fucking kidnapping somebody and tying them with their own shoe fucking laces, and I still escape. What sort of you? They must be the laughing stock of the IRA. I mean, how the fuck can I imagine for one minute that them two people and a third person could outwit MI5, Special Branch, and the all you see in the army. I mean, so the top and bottom of it was, they were actually either working as informants at the time of my kidnapping. I know the third person definitely was. So on top of all this, that third person would have told his handlers that I was going to be getting kidnapped, and he'd have told people who was going to be kidnapped me and all these different things. He would have known about that in advance. Those two people you have referred to in the past would probably vehemently deny they had any part in your kidnapping and I'm sure too they would deny they were involved in any way with the security forces. 
the damn people are a bit fucked now because I'll tell you for why. John Butcher is reviewing the case. John Butcher, if John Butcher does his job properly, which, you know, I'm hoping he does. I haven't got no confidence that he will. But if he does his job properly, he'll know who, who my kidnappers were because they left fingerprints behind, they left DNA behind, and there's other evidence, i.e. surveillance logs, TCG logs, all other information about the fucking interactions between me and Special Brand. So what happens is John Butcher, if he does his job properly, he'll be able to actually like nail that one down once and for all. For anyone who doesn't know, John Butcher is the Bedfordshire police chief who has taken on Operation Canova, which is an independent police investigation into the activities of the IRA's nutting squad. I myself have written quite a lot about you, Marty, when I worked in newspapers. And as we know, you have spoken out quite strongly about Operation Canova. And I have written many articles on that. And I can say that I have previously contacted Operation Canova and their press team multiple times and I never received a response to the allegations that you made. But we'll come to Operation Canova more in this episode and and also in the next episode, the final episode. What happened after you were hospitalised in Northern Ireland? I was taken... And I was kept in Pollesburg until about September, I think it was September, October, maybe late September, early October. And then, um, in fact, I know exactly when it was, if you want to do some checks, I haven't got the information. I actually left Northern Ireland on the morning after the fight. I think I, I get this confused all the time. It was either the fight between Chris Eubank and Nigel Ben. And if it wasn't Nigel Ben, it was Chris Eubank and the guy, Michael Watson. Now, I think Michael Watson got brain damaged in the fight. But it, what happens is, I mean, how I actually how I actually get things that I'm unsure of is it's events that happened at that time. But if the fight between um, Chris Eubank and Michael Watson was in September or October 1991, or if it wasn't that one of it was Chris Eubank and Nigel Ben, because I watched both of them, but I get the term confused. I'm sure it was a Michael Watson one. What happened was I left because me and the special branch were watching that fight that night, and I was leaving Northern Ireland uh, the next morning. How did you feel that day when you were leaving Northern Ireland for good? Were you relieved? Did you feel safer? Were you frightened? I was relieved. But also fucking frightened because do you know why? I had only been the I had only left Northern Ireland once in my life. I went to Glasgow for a weekend, and that was the first time I was ever out of Northern Ireland. And that was in 1990 or early 1991, and that was the only time I was outside Northern Ireland. And then when I was fucking leaving, obviously forever, I knew I was never going to come back. I was really really worried because I was only young. I was only 21 years of age. What were you leaving behind? Obviously, family. Before the actual um, events that led to my kidnapping. Me and my partner, who was the mother of my kids, what happened was we already had, like, you know, split. We were sort of, like, weren't actually in a relationship more. So, I mean, to me, I mean, that was another problem that I had because, obviously, we had to actually split up and I wasn't actually, like, in a relationship with her anymore. So I wasn't actually seeing her, obviously, and I was seeing less of, my sons, obviously, that I would have seen if I had been still, obviously, in a relationship with her. So you felt relieved. Did you feel safe? No. And the reason why I didn't feel safe, feel safe for, and I've always said this, the IRA, obviously, like, you know, never, ever give up. If they think that they can get information about somebody like me, who they regard as, like, fucking one of their biggest enemies, I always knew that they would be trying to identify get information about where I may be so they can actually try and target me. In fact, they actually did. I mean, they, they actually shot me during the peace fucking process in um, 1989. You were moved to England, given a new identity, money, to start your new life. All that came from the security services. Yeah, but I mean, to be honest with you, I got ripped off. 
I found out later on, and I could prove, that the fucking establishment, for whatever reason, shortchanged me out of probably close to £50,000. And I found out that from my own sort of fucking keeping asking questions and getting information and documents years and years and years of just never taking no for an answer. The stuff that I found out about my case since is fucking just unbelievable. Talk me through the process of beginning a new life under MI5. All they do is, quite simply, they decide with the person, the source, in this case me, what name that they're going to obviously give me, like a new name, and they the do it for our people too. And then what they do is, whenever they decide on a name, that obviously is going to actually stand up to any scrutiny and stuff and all like that. And once everybody's happy with that, they just issue all the new documents, say new driving license, new passport, new national insurance number. And from that moment, you have to put, like in my case, Marty McGartan completely like behind you. And you have to live like as a, a different person, as if like you've been reborn. I keep going back to the word relief, that you were relieved to have left Northern Ireland alive. But during this all, starting a new life, leaving everything behind, or being reborn as you have described it, was part of you not also grieving? Look, there's lots of people who will be listening to this, right? And people will listen to this for decades to come. People will listen to this interview for decades to come, and people will actually probably use this as some sort. I have no doubt that the security services will use this interview, or your interview with me, as some sort of instrument for training uh, in some shape or form relating to agents, people who actually work undercover on their behalf to see if they can actually make things better, to see if they can learn by mistakes, to see if they need to do stuff that they think, well, fuck me, this is this scandal. So they may think, well, you know, that's just the way life is. Fuck him, fuck everybody else. Uh, you know, the point I'm making to you is, right, my case, whether people like it or not, people will always judge me either on I'm nothing more than an out-and-out scumbag. I deserve everything I get. They've got no sympathy for me. You know, I'm just a low-life fucking prick. And there's other people who say, well, do you know what? I don't see him like that. I see him as somebody who is a person of principle. He believes in what he was doing, and there was no one or nothing could ever actually have actually you know, prevented him from doing what he believed was right. Now, I would like to think that there's more people who would look at me, like, for the latter, rather than the, the you, you know, the people who fucking like to see me dead tomorrow. But do you know what? None of that matters to me, because what I've always said is, right, nobody is ever going to be able to understand or even try to understand how difficult it is to live the life that I've had to live since September 1991. Because you know what? People in the area will be going, oh, yeah, Marty McGartan's really living a horrible, horrible life in existence. I go, yeah, yeah, I am. But you know what? I'm only living that horrible life in existence because the people who I sacrificed so much for, MI5 and Special Branch, decided that they wanted to punish me and they wanted to really, really make my life is, is sort of difficult and as horrible as it possibly could be. And do you know what? They've done such a wonderful job. Wonderful job. They couldn't have done any more. But you know what? Likewise, if they had been decent people and honourable people, they could have easily treated me and others like me. Example, Raymond Gilmore, Willie Carland, Kevin Fulton, Dennis Donaldson. You look at all those cases, and there's many, many others. They have always, always, always thrown them to the wolves. We're not important to them anymore, yeah? We basically did a job that it was a job well done, 
but they just go next. But the point I'm making to you is this. No one could ever, ever imagine what it's like to live in this life. And you know what? What's made things worse for me is, right? The security services have actually caused me, and also the police and the Cumbria police, they have caused me so many fucking problems since I was shot. And I'll tell you what, the IRA must be fucking rubbing their hands with glee because the security service, the MI5, the people who I actually fucking give my life literally to, to actually try to help them in the fight against terrorism, yeah, and the OUC and Spatial Branch, they actually made my life such a fucking misery. And what they've also done is, right, they have actually destroyed me mentally to such an extent that I can no longer go and have a job. I can no longer basically do normal things like you or anybody else who's listening to this podcast because I have been left with the most serious mental and physical disabilities as a result of pure, good, old-fashioned negligence by the state, particularly MI5 and Special Branch. They basically did everything possible. They made my condition 10 times worse than it could have been if they had to help me, and they had to basically honoured like a duty of care that they owe me and other people like me. But because I spoke out, because I dared to speak out, and because I wanted to tell my story, which I am very proud of what I, I have achieved, I'm really proud of what I did. And, and to me, I wanted to tell a story because I think I want people to know what happens in Northern Ireland. I want people to know the truth. I don't want people to be fooled and calmed and tricked into the special branch or the, uh, you, you, you know, the MI5 or the Home Office or the police's narrative of exactly what way people are treated who actually assist the security services. Because if they had their way, they would make you believe it's the most wonderful thing you can do. You work for us. You basically do your bit. And we will look after you, basically, and you will get all the help you need. With me, I got the opposite. Because I dared to speak out, right? Because I wanted to tell my story, they have fucking crucified me to this day. I've had all sorts of stuff, and it's never going to stop. But you know what? Fuck them. I've always said this. They will never, ever be able to break me. Yeah, the IRA tried to do it, and they can never do it. They fucking kidnapped my brother. They've beaten him, basically, 10 inches of his life. They fucking tried to get my mum's house burned down. You, you know, they, they, they virtually fucking drove one of my um, nephews basically to suicide because he actually became dependent on fucking antidepressants because he was getting bullied and so on and so on. My sister got put out of her house with her family, blah, blah, blah. All these things, they will never, ever break me. Never break me. And what happens is the quicker that they learn that, the better. Because do you know what? I'm going to keep on telling my story. And the reason why I'm going to keep on telling my story for is because everybody needs to know do you want to go? Do you want to help the establishment to fight terrorists? Do you want to put your life in danger to help them to fight terrorists? And do you want to live a life where these people are going to have virtually like you, you know, basically like dangling on a fucking string and treating you as if you're basically a fourth class citizen? Because that's what they do. They don't give a fuck about me. They didn't give a fuck about Ray Gilmore. They didn't give a fuck about Kevin Bulletin and all the other people. And that's just the way it goes. Once you've left and once you've done your bit, you're just left on your own. They were prepared to let me be murdered whenever I went to that fucking meeting, kidnapped by the IRA, when I had 24 hours notice. And then when I jumped out and escaped, and then they moved me on to the fucking mainland, they brought me to court, exposed my identity, told me that, oh, you know, no one's interested in killing you. The IRA haven't got the resources to come and kill you. And I get fucking shot seven fucking times outside my own house. And then what they went and done was they went and said, oh, it wasn't the IRA off the record. It was to do with drugs. He's, he's involved for drugs and stuff, not like that. And then whenever I went and they knew I was alive, they retracted that. And then they thought, oh, it wasn't. And then I sued them. And then what happened was all of a sudden they covered all that up too. They're the most dirtiest, devious, horriblest, evil cunts on the planet. Not a bit of fucking wonder that everybody who's even come anywhere in my case, anybody who's had the balls to come here, not a bit of wonder John Boucher's running for the fucking hills because he knows he's dealing with somebody who's really capable. John Boucher, when he hears my name, he must be shivering in his fucking boots because he must be thinking, this guy's not going to let me off the fucking hook and I'm not going to let him off the hook. John Boucher.
is a respected police chief and that's part of the reason why he was chosen to oversee this investigation into the IRA's nutting squad. I know you disagree with that, Martin, and we will get to why you disagree with that later on. I think it's clear to everyone listening to this that you feel you've been completely let down by not only the British state, their security services, but most agencies involved here. You were employed to go to the very heart of the IRA and fighting against their activities and you were cast aside. When you left Northern Ireland, you were sent to live in Whitley Bay and Tynan Weir. Did you feel settled there before the day came that you were tracked down by the IRA? Please listen, I'm going to tell you this, right? And this is no um, exaggeration. When I was living in Whitley Bay, between... 1997, after the court case, whenever they exposed me, up until the shooting. And I've said this, not publicly, but in conversations with people who have spoke to you on the phone. I was in the best position of my life for those two years. And the reason why is, yeah, because it goes back to what I said to you earlier. I have always been somebody who is, I don't mean getting my hands dirty, like work employment and stuff and all like that. And I don't really rely on the fucking state and stuff. And like, I, I would rather work. I felt a lot more sort of useful when I was doing things for myself and I was actually achieving something, yeah? By 1999, I actually had a property development business and I was actually working, renovating and develop, developing property right up until the day I was actually shot. And all of that is a result of what happened thereafter with the security services and stuff and all like that, right? I had to just basically like give it all up because the injuries that I've been left with, yeah, no exaggerating, are such mentally, particularly, as well as physically, means that I actually rely on my partner who has been with now for the past 23 or 4 years. And if it wasn't for her, I would be absolutely fucked. And you know what? I feel so guilty because she has had to sacrifice her career. She had to give up her job from the minute I got shot, and she's never been able to return to to her job because she helps me to do things that I cannot do for myself. I I actually get shot in the hands and stuff and all I got, and I need to basically have to rely on help because I can't do stuff that entails the use of, like, both hands together. And because of, like... um mental sort of psychological disabilities and stuff and all like that when i started to see obviously professional medical people psychiatrists and stuff and all as a result of the shooting the security services that told me obviously because of my unique circumstances that i couldn't go through the nhs and they organized for me to actually get professional help well when they organized to get me the professional help this was in between when I was moving to my second new identity, away from Newcastle upon Tyne, I was passed from the Cumbria Police's sort of um, uh, responsibility over to MI5s, and that's when everything really, really has fucking. It's been an absolute nightmare. I mean, the security services said to me, "We're going to get you psychological help." I go get a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist tells me, "Look." Your condition is such that you need at least three years treatment to be able to actually like treat your multiple conditions because of the shooting and stuff and all. And the security service says, we'll fund that obviously because you can't go through the NHS. So brilliant. Then what happens is whenever the psychiatrist actually starts to actually try to treat me, he says, look, your condition could take up to five years to actually be able to get you where I think we will actually be able to actually get you to during that period, maybe a bit before. And the security services, what they said was, were not funding any of your medical treatment after 12 sessions or 10 sessions. 
So because I wouldn't be able to afford to fucking pay private medical treatment and because I couldn't go through the NHS, I just had to fucking basically like accept that the security services were not going to fund it. And then the rest is history. My condition just fucking snowballed really badly out of um, like I couldn't have gone any worse. Talk us through how your identity was blown and how that happened through the courts and also involved the police. Something that many people would find inexplicable given that you were under the protection of the British security services. Because <clears throat> the top and bottom of it is the security services were hoping on Northumbria police were hoping that I would have been convicted for perverting the course of justice, which is a very serious offence. How does perverting the course of justice come into dealing with a speeding offence? Well, because what happened was I had two driving licences. I had a driving licence that I actually owned when I actually, you know, from Northern Ireland, actually under the name of McCartland. And then I had my new driving licence, the one that I was used obviously, for my new identity. Why did you have two driving licences? You were supposed to have a brand new identity. Simple. When I moved to... um, When I moved away in September, October 1981, shortly after that, Angela and my kids actually moved to England and they were living with me. And they stayed till the following year, in 2000... Or sorry, not 2000, in... Um, 1992, 92, yeah, the following year. And they stayed there with me till then. But obviously she got homesick. You know, couldn't see her family, her mum, her sisters, blah, blah, blah. Couldn't cope with living in England. And, you know, we decided, both of us, that it was only right that obviously she goes back because obviously she, she could never cope with living there. When she went back, <clears throat> I, myself and the special branch knew that the IRA were going to come knock on our door because she was with me. Obviously, you know, when she was living, they would have known she was living with me. So they would have wanted to get a hold of her to find out where I'm living, who I'm living with, you know, what's the situation, does he have people looking after him, etc., etc., etc. So the minute that I had found out that Angela wanted to return home, I had to go and I had to go and take advice off the local police which was Northumbria Police. And also they would have been actually getting advice from the security services. And also I was in contact with the RUC. And all they said to me was, ah, listen, don't worry, but I just let her come home. And, you know, we'll obviously like, you know, just try to find out what we can, but don't worry about it, just let her come home. And they said to me that, um, uh, you know, you won't have to move, just stay where you are. And I thought, for fuck's sake. I mean, she's going to go back home. If the IRA fucking pull her in, she's not, I wouldn't expect her to, but she's not going to be able to actually withstand fucking IRA and any type of IRA pressure and interrogation. And she's going to fucking obviously like be forced into telling them everything they want to know about me. And in fact, I told her when you go back up the Austria thing, just tell them everything you know. So your partner Angela left England to go home to Northern Ireland and you said... If the IRA pull you in and interrogate you, tell them where I am. Exactly, exactly. I knew what the IRA were capable of. So long story short was, I'm in a situation where at that stage, special branch are just basically like costing me adrift. Just think about this for a minute. They're telling me to just stay on a property that I'm living in in England where Angela knows all the details about, she knows my new name, she knows the address, she knows the postcode, she knows every fucking thing, and they want me to stay in that property. So I decided, right, this is where the problem actually really, really, uh, you know, raises its ugly head, and this is no sort of uh, fault of my own. I'm in a desperate situation where I'm trying to fucking think on my own, how can I actually try to make good of a really bad situation? So I thought to myself, right, Angela is back there. 
she's going to have to go and give them my um, name, blah, 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 blah. So I decided to actually change one of the driving licenses that I had, because I know, and I mean, I'm thinking it loud, I know the IRA have got contacts inside the driving license agencies and blah, blah, blah. So they can find out things. So I decide, right, off my own bat, because I know nobody's going to help me. The, the, the Northumbria police aren't helping me. Their special branch aren't helping me. The fucking RUC are just basically sending me, just stay there, you'll be all right, blah, blah, blah. It's not their problem. They're not going to have any fucking repercussions. So I decide that I'm going to transfer the driving license over to an address which is in a different county, County Durham, Durham, which is like a good distance for I'm living. But you're asking me why I needed two driving licenses for. I had to go to meet family members who didn't have a clue where I was living, who I couldn't tell for the same reason as like Angela. If they knew information, the IRA would come fucking after them and they'd fucking interrogate them and it'd probably hurt them to get information in them. So what they don't know, the can't tell. I was in a predicament where I had to either use my new identity at that time was Osh. This has been publicised all over the fucking thing. I was living under the name of Osh up until they exposed me in the 1997 court case. I either had to use that driving licence to go and meet family members. Now, when I used to go to the ferry at uh, Stranraer to meet family members and stuff and all, I couldn't have went with my Osh driving licence because if I had like, a stop by the cops for any routine reason or whatever, or it was an accident or something, I would have had to produce a driving licence fucking obviously with my new identity on. So what happened was I was thinking to myself, right, I'll use my birth name one year, and what I'll do was I'll put them in different addresses, and what happens is I'm keeping the both of them separate. And that was my way of thinking that I'm going to be able to actually like be cute and be clever. The fucking police thought, well, fuck you. you we're going to do you with a criminal offence, because that's pervert, perverting the course of justice. Because I had points on my um, birth name driving licence, and I had points on my one that, that was a new identity one. They knew that I had them two driving licenses because one was in my birth name and the other one was in an alias name that this fucking security services special bunch gave me. So they knew the two licenses was legit and they still come after me. At that court case, the judge says at the very beginning, he said to the prosecution, words to the effect of, I mean, do you want to actually go and like have a think and reconsider why or not you want to actually continue with this case? <laughs> And the prosecution going back, all this is in the second book, Dead Man Running, and they said, Your Honour, we feel that there's a case to be answered. Shortly before the court case, our Joseph had been taken away by the IRA, kidnapped. They went into his house. They, they, they virtually held him and his wife and kids at gunpoint. They put them into a cupboard, and they put sacks of mouth and fucking tied them up and blindfolded them and stuff and all, and took them into the Bollamer Face State and hung him upside down and beat him around bars. There's pictures of him and stuff and all. Joseph is your brother, and for anyone who doesn't know, he was more or less crucified by the IRA in what was described as a punishment beating. He was nearly dead. It was, it was carried out by the IRA because he had the same surname as me. So a judge was made aware of this attack on your brother, was made aware that you were still under threat because of your work, as a British agent, but a decision was still taken to name you publicly. Yeah, but it wasn't nothing to do with the judge, because at the end of the day, I don't think the judge can stop a case. I think he would cause all sorts of legal problems. But what I'm saying is, at the very start, he didn't know the full scale of it. That, that only all materialised as the case went on, because the case lasted for four days. You know, one thing that I should mention here, the reason why they were so, so keen, I say they, Northumbria Police Special Branch, and they were actually acting in concert with fucking the RUC. The reason why they wanted an MI5, the reason why what they wanted that court case to go on for, was because at that time, 50 Dead Men Walking, my first book, was just about to be published. So what they were, my my theory is this, they were trying to get me convicted of a criminal offence to say, well, you know, he's a common fucking criminal, you can't believe a word he says, and that was their way of trying to punish me. That timing and that link surrounding the film and its release isn't actually one I've heard before. You would think, though, still, that even if the British security services didn't want to protect you, they would still want to protect their secrets. Exactly. 
you hit the nail on the head. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to protect their secrets, and they thought by actually fucking like trying to get me sent to prison, they can discredit me as an out and out criminal, just a thug. They knew that I was the type of person who was going to go for broke. They knew that whenever they tried to fucking put me into a corner, I was going to fucking attack. I done some stuff that they probably fucking got really, really fucking shocked. I was shown pictures of our Joseph in fucking newspapers. There was an article that was written by Jenny McCartney. Jenny McCartney went to the hospital and interviewed our Joseph. No, Jenny McCartney from the Telegraph. And she interviewed our Joseph when he was in the hospital bed and took pictures and stuff. And on the thing that was out of the Belfast Telegraph, or fucking newsletter, took pictures of him too. And his legs were smashed to fuck. He had big fucking... They look like them sort of like... um. Do you know the, the, the bolts that they drill into your bones and stuff? And it's all held by clumps and stuff? No. He was in a really, really bad way. And they were trying to fucking say in the court, the prosecution, that all this stuff about your brother hanging upside down from a fence and you jumping out windows to escape the IRA is a figment of your imagination. You're just making this up to try and sell copies of your new book. And I thought, hang on a fucking minute here. I said, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Who, who told you that this is a figment of my imagination? And the prosecutor actually said that there's a special branch man outside the court, and he said that all this stuff's not true. And I said to the judge, Your Honor, can you please ask him, because of what he's saying, to bring that special branch man into the court? And they wouldn't bring him fucking in. They wouldn't bring him in. And I thought the reason why I'd want to bring him in for is because he stands in the fucking dock under oath and repeats that he'd be fucking done with perjury. My solicitor actually went, this is all in the second book. My solicitor went to the special case unit of the CPS who was dealing with my case, and he said to the special case officer and the CPS, look, this guy has only got a defense to say that he basically had to use these driving licenses, and he did so under duress, which was true. It was under duress. I used the driving licenses because I was trying to actually stay one step ahead of the IRA. That was my defence. Angela went back home. Angela was going to be getting fucking hauled in by the IRA. She was going to give them information. I had told her to be completely open with them. Don't fucking give them any excuse to harm you. Don't give them any excuse to basically cause you any any problems and stuff like that. So I knew. And then when you put into the mix, special branch, you told me, oh, don't worry about it. Just stay where you are. We'll keep an eye on Angela. But just you stay where you are. Don't move house. All these different things. So what I'm saying to you is, the special, the, the, the case walker said that, you know, he had went the MI5. This is in the book, the second book, Dead Man Running. He told my solicitor that he had went and he had spoken to the security services and the security services had told him, don't worry about it, just do him. So you were convicted then? No, I, I got acquitted. The fucking press, whenever they heard about fucking spies, fucking... You know, bombs getting neutralised and fucking the IRA getting the vultures. I was all over the newspapers for fucking weeks and months after that court case. Anybody with any common sense, looking back now, would say that they actually either made a complete cock up or it was more sinister than that. They wanted to try and cause me as many problems. And what I said was, and this is the truth, see if I had a guy convicted of that, which I could have, by the way. I could have had I went the other way. But if I had a guy convicted of that, right, I would have been sent to prison and I would have been killed in prison because the IRA would have fucking got people in prison to take, to take me out. Because the IRA's reach in prison in the fucking, on the mainland, it's fucking, I'll tell you, it's wide. Their reach is wide. They get a message into somebody to stab me in prison or fucking, basically, I'd have some sort of a fucking, a mysterious accent or something. Your identity was blown. You knew it was blown. But you didn't move. You stayed on Whitley Bay. I took the events and circumstances of that particular type of uh, circumstances whenever Angela had went back home. Because the special branch weren't helping me, because they were telling me, basically leaving me to my own devices, I took sort of, uh, I took matters into my own hands because I believed it was going to actually like, protect me, make me more safer, and that's the reason why I, I, I did with the, with the two driving licenses. But if I had went and done the same thing all over again, which I would have had to do because no one's helped me. The security services and the local police aren't helping me. They're saying to me, obviously, you know, you've got nothing to worry about. You know, there's been a security. I mean, there, there's a thing on, on my Twitter. If you get a chance, go on there. There's a statement that um, Northumbria Police, it was a joint statement by Northumbria Police and MI5, which is unheard of. 
MI5 called themselves the Crown Authorities. It was a joint statement released by them on the 29th of the 30th of September, 1997, and it was given to a program called BBC Here and Now. That's on there too, on my YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel, just look for um, Mark Barton YouTube and you go on there and it's on there. And I'm not fucking joking you about They told the BBC Here and Now program through their solicitors that the threat against me was not such that I was required to leave my present home address. In other words, I was safe. I could still stay there. And then what happened was, obviously, fucking the rest is history. The IRA come along during the ceasefire and fucking shot me. And did you ever believe the police and MI5's assertions that you were safe? Of course I didn't. Do you know what happened? This is the God's truth. The News of the World done a story on me at the time. I'll never forget I was so frightened and so convinced that the IRA were going to come and get me soon after that court case that I was actually living in the back of a fucking car at different places. And I remember the news of the world coming and doing a story on me and they took a picture of me actually sleeping at a, a, a motorway service station. I was actually sometimes sleeping at a motorway service station, different motorway service stations in the car park. I have always been very, very sort of... Um, conscious about security and stuff, but I always have been. One thing you need to actually um, take into account was up until that court case, no one obviously knew what part of the the actual country I was in. Even though Angela had went back home with my kids, she was able to tell them where I was last living. But because I had took that decision, right, to leave there, I left because I wouldn't take the fucking special branches of advice and just stay there. I wasn't convinced that I was going to be safe. So I left, yeah. The only people who thought they knew where I was was probably the IRA because she would have given information. But they would have known that I'd have been fucking gone, long gone by the time they'd have tried to do something. And I was, so they wouldn't be to get me because I wasn't there no more. But what I'm saying to you is, whenever the court case actually gave all my details out, right, what that did was, right, that sent a message back to the IRA that, look, one, we know from Angela Crane that he was living in that area. We had presumed, if he had any fucking sense, that he would be long gone. But because between 1982 and she went back, in 1987, whenever the court case happened, when I, when I got exposed by the cops, they then knew that I was still in that area. So when they, they started to target me, yeah, during that period of 97 to um, the 17th of June, on the day of my shooting, 1999, less than two year period, they were fucking targeting me, obviously finding a way of actually being able to actually, they, you know, fucking uh, shoot me or put a bomb under my car, whatever, or whatever they were going to do. They were actually doing things behind the scenes. And the top and bottom of it was, right, it gave them the information that they needed to know that I was still in that area. Take me to that morning in June 1999 when the IRA finally tracked you down. Well, what happened was, obviously, I was trying to live a life that, you know, I was trying to make my life as normal as possible. And what happened was, I actually had, I used to park, I had two cars. One car was a little sort of like a cheap run around and I had a brand new car that I just bought. And that used to be kept in like a back, sort of like a yard, but it had like an up and over garage door. I, either in the mornings, I used to go out the front into the little runabout car. They actually drive uh, my partner to work because she used to work on a local hairdresser's. Or sometimes I used to go in the new car, which is at the back of the house in a um, garage. And... On that morning, on the 17th of June, 1989, I went out into the backyard and I opened the um, garage door and I vividly remember looking up and down. And when I looked up and down the lane, I didn't see nothing that looked on toward. It looked just pretty normal. It was a summer's day. And that was about probably quarter past, 20 past eight in the morning. And I actually went back to the car. I get into the car. And that morning... Because everybody knew who I was, because of the court case and stuff and all like that, people used to always say to me, oh, can I have one of your same books, blah, 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 blah. Well, a couple of days before, somebody had asked me, can I say in a book to them? And I actually had signed the book, and I put it in the footwell of the passenger side, 
and I was just about to drive out of the actual um, the, the backyard, and I actually the book that I had actually threw onto the footwell on the passenger side of the car, it had actually opened. And you know when a book opens, the pages bend and stuff and all like that. So I leaned across the axle fucking like you know straight up because I didn't want to damage the book. And as I was actually doing, I came back up, and I noticed like you know something fucking actually like um at the side of your fucking thing. And I remember vividly it was like a green sort of like a look like somebody dressed in green, like a green coat or whatever. And when I looked fucking up, I seen somebody basically. I didn't even see faces. I just seen a fucking person there. And I vividly remember seeing all this green, and I seen what a new look like a fucking gun. And I'm not joking you about. Two shots were fired, and I was in the driver's side of the car. I got lifted like a fucking little doll, and fucking threw with the force of the shots over into the passenger side of the car. Now, I couldn't get out of the car the passenger way because the actual yard in the back of the uh, our our property was virtually against the wall, so the passenger seats, the passenger side of the car was virtually against the wall, so you couldn't even open that door. To get my missus into the car, I would have had to drive out of the actual yard to go into the back fucking lane for her to be able to get into the car. I'm on the passenger seat of the car. Now, at that time, I presume, because obviously, I think the car door was still open or the window or whatever, I can't, I can't really remember, but the door was either open or the fucking window was open, one of the two, and the fucking person, when I was in the passenger seat of the car, when I got through across, actually leant into the car and pointed the gun to try and point over towards my head. Well, obviously, again, I fucking instinct, I went to fucking basically survival mode, so I actually launched forward, and I grabbed, well, I pushed the gun, like I actually physically pushed and tried to grab the gun, and an R shot went fucking off, fired right through my fucking hand, and then what happened was the person actually like panicked, pulled away, fucking stood back, fired about probably about north three or four fucking shots. And then what happened was in total I've shot fucking probably about at least six. The that the consultant said seven bullet seven bullet holes. But I, I get shot at least six or seven times. Shot at least six times. How were you able to even raise the alarm? Well, what happened was the door was open to the car. Obviously, that's how the fucking gunman must have landed into the car. It was either, see, I'm in the passenger seat by this time, and obviously adrenaline, think about this, fucking smell of fucking gun residue and fucking gunpowder inside the car. And honestly, I'm not even speaking about this to you now. I get real bad panic attacks. What happens is, I mean, to me, all of these things, when I even think about it, really, really fucking, like, traumatizes the fucking, it makes me, like, really, really, like, brings it all back. But what happens is, I mean, when I'm in a situation, in that situation, I can't get out the passenger side. I can't get out the fucking driver's side because the gunman's there. Obviously, he's nearly inside the fucking car. And what happens is, I'm in a situation where I have to fucking try and fight to basically stay alive. I haven't got no more options open to me. And the only way that I knew how to fucking basically try to protect myself was to actually try to get a hold of the fucking weapon. But when I actually, I, honestly, the gun was virtually in the palm of my fucking hand. And I'm not joking you about, if I hadn't a shot, if I hadn't already been shot twice, the first two shots went into my side, if I hadn't already been shot for them first two times, yeah, I probably could have made a good effort to get that gun off that fucking person. And God knows what would have happened. Did you look into the gunman's eyes? Do, do you know what, listen? I probably fucking did, but you know what? Like I said, he, nothing would have registered because as I said, he, the way I was, I was in a car. He was outside the car. He ended up leaning into the car when I was fucking virtually like propelled across into the passenger side. So I'm in the land position. So I'm virtually looking up at a window and a fucking door, which is a jar that's actually opened here. And what happens is this person basically decides He's going to come in to actually like finish me off, obviously shoot me in the head. And I thought, not today, mate. Not the fucking day. Was the gunman masked? The the police reckon that they were wearing the police reckon that they were wearing fucking disguises. I'm just going to read a BBC News article that was published a year after your shooting. 
Detective Superintendent Chris Simmons of North Humbria Police told a news conference in Belfast that a DNA sample taken from the scene could link a presently unidentified person to the plot to kill the former Royal Ulster Constabulary Special Branch agent. He said, We have strong forensic evidence in the form of a DNA sample of one of the persons we believe was involved in the crime. The detective added, Mr. McGartland was shot with a CZ 9mm semi-automatic self-loading pistol. Mr. Simmons played a message left on an answering machine by a man suspected of involvement in the attempt to kill Mr. McGartland. He also gave descriptions of three men believed to have been involved in the planning and preparation of the attempt on Mr. McGartland's life. It is thought the suspects, who had Scottish and Irish accents, may have stayed in the Northumbria region for up to 10 days before the shooting. The first man was described as white, aged 35 to 37, between 5 foot 7 and 5 foot 8, trim with short, straight, light-coloured hair, and was smartly dressed. Police said he had the appearance of an office worker and was described as chatty, a good talker, and as having a distinctive Scottish or Irish accent. The second suspect was white, in his late twenties, five foot ten to five foot eleven, medium built, with dark brown or black hair and a short back and side style, and quote, quite fit looking. He was also described as being clean shaven and smart in appearance and was, quote, well spoken with an Irish accent. The third man was white, between thirty and thirty five years old, five foot ten to five foot eleven, slim with bony shoulders, untidy dark brown colour length hair, and with a Scottish possible Glaswegian accent. That is a wealth of information even Just 12 months after your attempted murder, do you, Marty, know the identity of the gunman who tried to shoot you? No, but the police know. MI5 know. I honestly do believe this is the truth. I've never said this before, but I believe because the police and MI5 would have been convinced that I was, although they won't admit to me, that I was definitely under sort of a threat. I honestly believe that MI5, Special Branch, and in particular the local Northumbria Police, would have had sort of uh, advanced intelligence or information from other agents and informers, obviously, that the IRA were at the very least really interested in targeting me. And if I'm right, they would have actually had sort of surveillance on my property at one time. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if they actually have footage of me actually being shot shot, because they would have surveillance on my property. But to be honest with you, you know, I am obviously convinced now, and John Boucher has got all the answers, and he fucking better start, you know, fucking basically explaining himself. But I'm convinced now that the person who shot me is actually, again, like I said about the people who kidnapped me, has actually been blackmailed into uh, working for the security services or special branch, because of my shooting. Either he was an informer or an agent before my shooting, or because of the DNA that he left behind, fingerprints and other evidence, they went and said, here we go again, Marty's led us to another fucking good source. Right, listen mate, you're going to go down for 25 years, you need to kill this bloke, you've left him with life's fucking um, changing injuries and disabilities. The guy basically is completely fucked. You're going to go down for a very, very long time Marty's going to go to court and he's going to tell a story about how you fucking left him basically like a complete shadow of the person he used to be and you've left him basically just completely fucked up mentally and physically. And he probably thought, oh my God, please, Mr. Special Branch, please, Mr. MI5, I don't want to go to the jail. Let's, let, let's, 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 let's basically like, you know, do a deal. And that's what Dirty MI5 and the Humbria Police and the OUC Special Branch done. They used me again, and they used my fucking um, my fucking type of circumstances to basically fucking recruit more informers. Who or what saved you that day? Because the injuries you sustained, it's a miracle you survived. Three people came to my rescue, yeah, and the three people were neighbours. I lived in the street behind me. 
And fortunately for me, they heard the gunshots and they ran out and they had the foresight because they knew who I was. Because of the court case, they knew who I was. In fact, one of the little blokes who came to actually, um, you, you know, he came to fucking actually help me. He actually came to my door after he found out about the court case and after everybody knew who I was. And he asked me to sign a book for his mum because his mum had read the book. And what happened was Adam uh, Cannon, him and his brother Ben, who I knew, and their stepdad, Peter Cannon, and also their mum, Andrea Cannon, God bless her, she died shortly after of cancer. She actually had terminal cancer and she died. And what happened was them three plus the mum, four people, all were trained in first aid. How fucking lucky was I that day? So it was your neighbours that saved your life that day? Without doubt. And you know what? The horrible special branch, the minute that they found I'd been shot, they would have taken over the control room and they fucking told the firearms officers, and this is on public record, they told the firearms officers and the omelets that they were not to go into the street where I was lying, bleeding to death. When I was lying there, one minute, the blood was five inches away from me. Ten minutes later, it was fucking probably double that. And then 15 minutes later, it was even more, even more all my holes all plugged. I was losing blood from everywhere, but only them people plugged them as best as they could. They saved my life. But the fucking special branch and also MI5 kept the fucking omelets and also the firearms unit. A firearms unit, I mean, a fucking specially trained firearms unit. They kept them all away and they were actually sitting at a metro station, which is a quarter of a mile away from my house, while I was lying fucking bleeding to death. And they decided 20 minutes later that they'd send them in. Now you imagine, you just imagine somebody with at least six or seven bullet holes. What happens is, when somebody gets shot, the, the consultant told me, the one that goes through is the entry wound, and the one that goes out the other side is the exit wound. So if you get shot once, there's two holes. If you get shot twice, there's four holes, except, except, except. I had no fewer than a dozen different fucking holes all over my body, where blood pissing out of them all, and then people were trying their best to save me when the fucking ambulance was actually been held back by the police. Because you know why, Trish? They wanted me to fucking die. I was a problem, right? And I was somebody who was a thorn in their fucking side, and they didn't want me to survive. After the shooting, you had to be relocated once again. A new identity, a new life, to the tune of 1.5 million, if we can believe what has been printed in the press previous. Was that not protecting you, or... What way did you view that? They were actually dragged, dragged, kicking and squeezing in that situation. You just imagine this for a minute. When I got shot, if you go and look at the press interest in my shooting at that time, there was a, a, a supposedly a peace process. There was loads of pressure on Mo Modem, on Tony Blair's government, and also on other Northern Ireland secondaries and ministers and stuff at that time. Because of my shooting and other shootings, Speedy Fagan, Bulldog Downey, and other ones, right? And the fucking David Trimble and other um, Jeffrey Donaldson, all those people were really, really fucking going both barrels, saying to the government that my shooting and the other shootings was all breach of the fucking peace process, and they wanted prisoner releases stopped and all this. And that was a really big fucking thing. Martin McGuinness was eating on fucking. Uh, one of the programs, and he was getting asked at one of them some deep fucking politics programs, and he was on the were asking him questions about me and stuff and all like that. So they were under immense pressure. And what happened was, the fucking um, government had to be seen to be doing something. You know, here you have a state agent. I was an agent of the fucking state who was shot, fucking basically nearly murdered, in broad daylight, in a fucking small seaside town in the middle of England. They had to do something. And what happened was, they did do something, but it was through greater fucking teeth. So you moved away again. Did you feel safe? Well, to be honest with you, I never felt safe because this is one thing you have to also take into account, as you pointed out. I had up to a dozen different firearms officers looking after me. Now, one thing I'll say is, I mean, I always have had a real, real bad um, relationship with Northumbria Police. They're devious fuckers. 
But you know what? The farms people were the most fucking nicest people you I could ever uh, hope for. They have my best interests at heart, and they were very sympathetic to my fucking plight. I mean, I could see that. I mean, way they were really, really fucking. I think they had a lot of respect for me. But you know what? It was their bosses who were really, really fucking had it in for me. I was shot in June. I think it was July or August. I was contacted by Martin Bashir from Trevor McDonald, tonight with Trevor McDonald, and I went on there talking about saying about this was the IRA, blah, blah, blah. Well, the fucking cops and special branch in MI5 done everything to try to prevent me from going on that program. They got my solicitor and virtually, virtually threatening my solicitor, saying that if he leaves here, he's not getting back in and stuff. And all I got, you want to talk about this and all, because it's really dangerous and he's putting himself in danger and he's putting the public in danger and all these different things. They were doing everything possible. And the reason why is because they didn't want me on talking on the fucking national TV program saying the IRA are actually getting fucking basically freedom to run around shooting fucking people and our government's allowing it to happen. And they wanted me to keep fucking quiet. When did you start to make a fuss about how you were being treated? Immediately after my shooting. I mean, you have to try and basically visualise this. I have I've been shot at least six times, probably seven. And what happened was, Northumbria police, because I was left, lying in the backyard, left to bleed to death, only for the help of them people who helped me, yeah? Northumbria police had believed, as many other people had believed too, that I was never going to survive. I get taken to hospital, put in surgery. When I'm in surgery, getting fucking basically like treated for all these fucking injuries, unknown to me until much later, fucking Northumbria police, obviously, no doubt, with the uh, acting in concert with the OUC and the special branch in MI5, because they've been telling the public and they've been telling the media and also me that I wasn't in any danger, I was okay to stay where I was, the IRA, you know, weren't going to do him any harm, blah, blah, blah. They were briefing the fucking media off the record that my shooting didn't have nothing at all to do with the IRA. It was a local dispute between feud and drugs gangs, and I was a member of one of the gangs, and I was just shot as a result. Well, this is all off the record. But all of this only basically started to come to, obviously, my attention. And I was only even made aware of this by journalists and stuff and all. When I was actually starting to actually fucking, like, you know, make contact with people, like, a couple of days after my shooting. And then the more I spoke to people through, like, fucking June and July and August, I was getting more and more information. And I couldn't fucking believe that the Thumbria police were actually smearing me, trying to fucking say that I was involved in drugs and trying to say that I was shot by local drug dealers. For anyone listening to this, and I've said it before in this episode, it's inexplicable as to why the security services, the police and so many other agencies would go this far to discredit and smear you. Is it a case of multiple, multiple incompetence or is it something much more sinister than that? <laughs> 